So I'm going to talk tonight about precious metals and the uh, work I've done over the last 20 years or so uh, to understand the role of iron in the oceans and in our climate. And let's see if I can get this to work. There we go. So I'm going to try to sort of weave a couple of themes through my talk tonight. And the first is that this is a story about iron. There we go. 56, the molar mass. And iron is the most important metal for the health of humans and the health of almost all organisms in the world. And this is supposed to be a picture showing you the effects of anemia. So on the left, I know you can't tell, it's an anemic hand. It's a hand of a person who is lacking in iron and they're lacking in um, hemoglobin, which is the protein in our red blood cells that carries oxygen to all the other parts of our body. And it's just a demonstration of the importance of iron to human health. On the right hand, on, on the right hand, on the right side, we have a, a nice rosy red hand of a healthy person. So iron is critical to human health. It's also critical to plants in the world. And when plants don't have enough iron, they can't make enough chlorophyll, and the, the green pigment that allows them to take the sun's energy and turns it, turn it into chemical energy. And you can see this here. We call this chlorosis, and you've got these nice green leaves, and then in contrast, you have these yellow leaves, and they just don't have enough pigment because they're iron limited. And even though iron is about 4% of dirt, it's a good fact for you all to know, 4% of dirt, so there should be a lot of iron in the ground to support the growth of plants, but iron chemistry affects how available that is. And so that's why when you want to get your plants to grow more, you don't necessarily add more iron, but you might add some lime or you might add some other compound to your garden that will release that iron and let it grow. And that's exactly what we're trying to do in the ocean. Now, another fun fact here that I want you to take home, there is one organism in the world that we know does not require iron. Does anybody know what the one organism that, we do, that does not require iron that we know of? Any hands? Any hands? Unfortunately, some of us might, have, might know a lot about this. It's actually the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, interestingly enough. So, not the tick, but the, actually the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi uh, was shown um, both first through its genome and then through measurements of the metal proteins that it doesn't require... Oh, am I too loud? Sorry. I really like to talk. I'm going to adjust my power. Let's see here. I've been taught how to do this. All right, turn that. How about that? Too little? Too, too loud? Too loud. Oh, we want a little more in the back. Nope, too much. Perfect. I'm going to stop. Okay. <laughs> okay. So anyway, Lyme disease doesn't require iron. And it replaces the iron-requiring proteins with manganese-requiring ones. And that's a way to deal with the fact that the human body, when it's trying to fight infections, tends to suck iron away from those organisms. And so these sneaky little buggers have figured out a way around that. Okay, so it's an iron story. This is also a story about climate. And climate is something that's, that matters a lot to me. I think it's going to matter a lot to my kids. Hope it, I hope it's something that matters to you. And the climate has changed significantly in the past, before humans had any impact. So this is now I'm really talking about natural climate change. And this is just a graph demonstrating that. This is data going back for temperature, global temperature, going back almost 450,000 years. And this is data we get from looking at ice cores in Antarctica. And as we go back in time, we can see these variations, these cycles in global temperature. And there are cycles of maybe about 8 degrees Fahrenheit on average. And those cycles correspond with changes in sea level. And these sea level, this scale is in, you know, 400 feet of sea level. This is pretty significant, right? We're going to really notice this if the oceans change by 400 feet. And you can see here we are in the modern time, what we call the Holocene. It's a relatively warm time. And 20 years ago, we had our last ice age and it was significantly colder, and the water, the sea level was significantly lower because a lot of that water was locked up in glaciers that were on land. And this impacts, you know, much about the world we live in. And so there's, you know, significant important questions about what's causing these, these cycles. What has been driving these in the absence of humans? And the feeling is, the, the general consensus is that these are driven by solar cycles, the Milankovitch cycles we call them, where the sun gets varying amounts of energy uh, the, excuse me, the Earth does, as it moves around the sun over time. But that doesn't explain the whole picture. That sort of forces the effect, but something else is actually causing these to turn into changes in carbon dioxide and temperature. And I'm going to tell you tonight that one of those factors, we think, is iron getting into the ocean. That iron takes the signal of the sun and converts it into changing temperature on our Earth. So this is a story about climate. 
And finally, this is a story about basic science. And this is a theme that I'm going to try to touch on a couple times tonight, where I'm going to try to make the connection between measurements or tools that people developed that were made for one purpose and then used to help make a discovery for another purpose. And this is really basic science. It's when we do things for the sake of discovery, and I think that there's enormous benefit to, to our society that we gain from that. And I admit I feel a little bit that basic science is under attack these days. Am I still too loud, Debbie? No? Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and so, you know, I, I was trying to figure out what picture do I show for basic science. You know, I could show a big beaker. But I decided as an oceanographer, I'd show one of my favorite parts of oceanography, which is the cruise picture that you take at the end of a cruise. And many people here have many of these pictures. This is taken at the end of a cruise uh, to the Southern Ocean to look at icebergs. These cruises can be great fun. Everybody's got a smile on since we're at the end of the cruise. They can be pretty stressful as well. You may not be able to recognize me, but here I am. I was actually, I got bald by the end of this cruise. No, I'm, I'm kidding, I'm over there. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> couldn't tell if it was too bright for you to get that joke. But uh, in any case, I love, the, I love the teamwork aspect of science. Um, and that's not just unique to oceanography, I think. It's true for many parts of science. Um, but hopefully you'll, you'll come away from this talk being even more excited about basic science. OK, so we're going to start. Bird's eye view looking down on the Earth, looking down on the Gulf of Maine. This is a true color satellite image. Here's the Gulf. We're somewhere around here. And what you can see, hopefully, you may not be able to see it from the back. I apologize for the contrast. But are these beautiful swirls of green and brown and red that are phytoplankton in the ocean, single-celled plants in the ocean. And that, of course, is what we really focus on, much of our work on here at Bigelow. And Bigelow was founded by uh, one of the founders, Charlie Yench, was a pioneer in using satellites to study the ocean. So it's really appropriate to start with this slide. And this demonstrates just the, the, the scale of the information we can get about the ocean from satellites. Now, if you take this image, you take these images over the whole globe, and you take them daily as you go around and around the globe in your satellite, you can generate an image like this. And some of you may have seen these before. This is a false color image, so we've, we've made the colors look a little prettier. But they show the distribution of chlorophyll, the plant pigment, over the entire globe averaged over a year. And biological and chemical oceanographers, which many of the people who work here are, spend a lot of their time at, their, at the core trying to understand what controls the distribution of plants in the ocean. That's what this is showing, this chlorophyll. There's parts where there's much more productivity, up here, for example, in these high latitudes. And there are these big regions in the middle of the ocean, in these gyres, we call them, where there's very low nutrients, there's very low nitrogen, and, and you have very low productivity or, um, or plant growth in those, in those areas. And we're trying to understand what controls that. And hopefully you'll understand why that's important uh, in, in this talk. So this is the distribution of plant material in the ocean. And here's the distribution of nitrate. Can't, you cannot, this is not you know, about iron versus nitrate, at least not yet. So here is the nitrate concentration um, measured over thousands and thousands of measurements that have been compiled over many years. And it shows some pretty striking uh, signals or differences across the globe. Again, you can see in these lower latitude areas, you say sort of deep blue and dark purple colors that indicate that essentially all of the nitrogen, this important uh, nutrient for plants, has been drawn down. The plants have taken up as much nitrogen as they can, and then they've stopped growing. But then there's this really striking area around Antarctica. This is in the Southern Ocean, and it is you know, yellows and reds, showing that we've got very high concentrations of nitrate. And you see concentrations building up also here in the uh, subarctic North Pacific. And if you squint your eyes, even from the back, you might be able to see some slightly lightly co lighter colors around the equ equatorial Pacific. And this was known, this observation was started to be observed even back in the 1930s when people started going down to Antarctica and found these high concentrations of nitrate. And people said, what's, what is co what's controlling this? Why are the phytoplankton in these regions not drawing down all of the nitrogen like they do in the rest of the ocean? Something must be you know, controlling. Some of them, something is holding them back from using up all of the nutrient. Story here about explaining how we know this. How was it that it took 80 or 90 years for oceanographers to figure out that they were making bad iron measurements? And we could, the credit for that belongs to a geochemist named Claire or Pat Patterson. Picture of him here. He, uh, he really came into science in the, right after the World War II, in the late 40s. And his project uh, at the University of Chicago was to try to figure out the age of the Earth. Seems like maybe a pretty important question, something that we did not know at the time. There were lots of guesses about the age of the Earth. And the way that he was trying to do that was he was trying to look at the ratio of 
of uranium and lead in meteorites. So these rocks that had come from outer space that come from the beginning of the, of the universe, the Big Bang. And by looking at the ratio of these two elements, one which decays into the other through radioactive decay, you can tell the age of the Earth. So he was trying to make measurements of lead in, and uranium in, in meteorites. And what he kept finding was that his samples were contaminated because there was a lot of leaded gasoline being used and there was a lot of lead paint being used and there was lead everywhere, lead pipes, lead was being used in all sorts of things. And it really gave him an appreciation for the impact of lead on his samples, such that if you can see this picture, this is him. You won't be able to see this either, unfortunately. Uh, he is scrubbing the floor of his lab. He has covered the lab with plastic tarp. And great, incredibly, he's not wearing any shoes or a shirt. This is uh, definitely a 1970s uh, safety, you know, <laughs> safety what not to do. He's just bending over with his, with his, <laughs> with his broom. Um, but he basically figured out that only by truly basically walling off your lab from all of the metal sources, could he make, could he make measurements of lead that were accurate um, and not contaminated. And when, by doing that, he was the first person, he was able to make the first measurement, accurate measurement of the age of the Earth, which is, next test, anybody? Yeah, four and a half, 4.55 billion years old, pretty old. And he was able to do that by using lead isotopes. And so it was through his work that we figured out, wait a second, we're not only can making contamination of lead, we're contaminating all sorts of things. And oceanographers picked up on that and started to use cleaner techniques. So this is me and uh, Jason Hopkins, a former postdoc at Bigelow, taking measurements of, of iron in the ocean now. And you can see instead of using this metal cable that we've pushed to the side, we now use a non-metal line. This is made of Kevlar, doesn't rust, and we put a bottle on it that is made of plastic, it's coated in Teflon, we've replaced everything we can with plastic, and with this kind of a technique, we're able to get clean measurements. Once we bring that bottle on board, we don't bring it into our rusty lab, we have a special van that is made of, essentially lined with plastic, it has fans, HEPA fans in the, in the uh, roof that put in only filtered air, you can see the bottles are lined up here. When we can't get nice fancy vans like that, we do exactly what Clara Patterson did, we cover everything with plastic sheeting. So trace metal chemists in the ocean know exactly where in Home Depot to buy the right kind of tarp <laughs> to cover everything. It's really true. <laughs> and we bring our bottles in, and we, we, we sample them in clean environments. And we wear Tyvek suits. We put on our special little bouffant caps, and uh, we collect our water. So applying this technique, this is what's happened to ocean iron concentrations over time, remarkably from the 30s and 50s and earlier in, this, in the 20th century, they went from hundreds of nanomoles per liter down to less than one in most cases. And it wasn't because the ocean changed, it's because we stopped contaminating our samples. Okay, so here we are, we're in the, we're in the 90s, 80s, we finally started good at getting good at measuring iron. And this led credence and support for the iron hypothesis that iron was controlling productivity in these parts of the ocean. So the person who really, who really made, who brought clean technique to the ocean and made these first observations was, was someone named John Martin. He was a Colby grad from the 60s, and he was working in California. And once he figured, discovered low iron in the ocean, he was looking for iron on other places. And he looked in Antarctic ice cores like this one that are drilled down and pulled up. And when he looked back in time, so we're going from the surface of the ice core in this figure down 2,000 meters, really deep, mile basically down in the ice. And that allows us to go back in time, back to about 140,000 years ago. This is the same kind of data as I showed earlier. And what he observed was that this is carbon dioxide concentration trapped in the bubbles in the ice, that at times when the carbon dioxide concentration went down in the past, the iron was higher, and vice versa. So that the carbon dioxide and iron were inversely correlated. And he said, aha, uh -huh, this is pretty darn interesting. I think that I hypothesize that iron and the natural fertilization of the ocean by dust is drawing down carbon dioxide and affecting climate. And he put that forward as another hypothesis, and he called it creatively the iron hypothesis. <laughs> and scientists have spent the last 20 or 30 years basically trying to figure out and test that hypothesis, and I'm one of those people. And he was a pretty good advertiser for his ideas. And so he not only came up with a cool graph on a nicely cited paper, but he gave a pretty provocative statement that has gotten a lot of uh, repeat repetition over the years. He said, give me half a tanker of iron and I'll give you the next ice age. And that is an idea that we have really been working to test for many years. And I'll talk more about that. Okay, so this idea 
this, uh, this both the debate between grazing and iron and this understanding suddenly that iron was very low led people to start saying, let's go out and actually do an experiment. Before this, in, in the, actually in the open ocean, before this, people had done bottle incubations, which is very common. We like to go out, we take water, put it in a bottle, add various nutrients, and see what happens. And the people who were supporters of the grazing hypothesis said, well, that doesn't, that doesn't work, because when you put it in a bottle and put it on the deck of the ship, you're eliminating the grazers that could eat that, the, the phytoplankton. You need to do it in the water, in the whole community, and understand how it responds. So this led to the completion of several what we call in situ, or in place, iron addition experiments, that where we went out and, sort of, and fertilized a large patch of water, usually maybe 10 by 10 kilometers. Um, maybe 100 square kilometers. So the first one was done in 1993. It was called Iron X. And uh, if you can see, they're dumping these barrels of, of uh, iron into a tank. And they fertilized this patch. And immediately, that patch of water was subducted, or it was moved underneath another parcel of water. And there was suddenly not enough light for anything to grow. So hundreds of thousands of dollars <laughs> down the drain, um, because that experiment couldn't work. Right? That water had been taken away. So scientists are, uh, are persevering folks. We are not you know, uh, going to be put off by one failure. So they went back out again in 1995 to repeat this experiment, Iron X2. And in fact, they created a huge bloom. They created a massive bloom of phytoplankton that uh, the phytoplankton concentration increased about 30 times, 30-fold in a week. And in fact, it, uh, the, carbon, the amount of carbon that was converted into plant biomass was about 2,500 2, tons of carbon, which is about the same amount as 100 redwood trees. So in a week, the community, in this, the, the phytoplankton community, created 100 redwood trees of biomass, which shows you how responsive the plankton in the ocean can be and how powerful they can be. So that was the first really successful demonstration of that. And others have happened in other places in each of these three regions, including, I'll just mention this one since I participated in this. This was one of the last ones done in 2002, and I talked my way onto it as a graduate student. Someone came to visit Stony Brook on sabbatical, and I went into their office and got talking, and I said, you know what, I'd like to go on that cruise. And they said, well, I don't know if we have room. And I kept bugging them and made, it, made, my, made my way onto it. And this was a similar experiment as the others. We took, these are shipping containers of iron sulfate powder, we put them into these large tanks, filled them with seawater, acidified it so it would dissolve, and you drag a garden hose around for a couple days, and you add iron to the ocean. And this is now where these, these ocean iron fertilization experiments have been done. Each of these dots is one of these of experiments. These are the SOFEX experiments that I just talked about. There's Iron X. And you can see they've been done in these three HNLC regions, the Pacific, the Equatorial Pacific, and the Southern Ocean. And Almost invariably, these have created massive blooms. So one of the best ways, as we've already learned, to look at these is from space. And these are such large blooms that we can observe them from space. So this is, a, again, an ocean color image of phytoplankton. I know, probably hard to tell. May, I don't know if anyone can identify where this is based on the coastline. No? <laughs> this is the Northeast Pacific. This is the Charlotte, I think the Queen Charlotte Islands. This is Alaska up here. And it's very cloudy. So all the black here is clouds where you can't get that. But here is the patch. So that patch is about 30 kilometers by 30 kilometers in size. This is about a month after iron was added. And again, it shows you, I think, just how massive these, these features can be. We can observe them from space. Here's another one. This is the soiree experiment. It was done in the Southern Ocean, and it created this beautiful patch. And actually, the patch was a square when they made it. But of course, the oceans are constantly in motion, and there's constantly shear that's moving those, those waters, and it got pulled into this thin, this thin sort of tendril of a patch over, over a month. This is a month after it had been added. But all of these have shown major, um, major blooms in the ocean. And the idea here is that the iron is what we call priming the biological pump. And the biological pump is the idea that phytoplankton in the ocean, these, these single-celled plants, can take up carbon dioxide, turn it into plant material. Some of it gets eaten and respired back to carbon dioxide, but some of it sinks down. And the carbon that sinks down to the bottom, and uh, it removes that carbon from the atmosphere. And this carbon that sinks to the bottom is what makes coal. It was what makes fossil fuels. So there's been a lot of benefit to us. But it also removes that CO2 from the atmosphere. And so this is this biological pump. And the idea is that here's, here's the pump, carbon dioxide going into plants and being brought down, and that when you add iron, you create more of those plants. And you, in fact, create bigger plants 
and eukaryotic plants that tend to sink more because they have glass shells, and that they will increase the flux downward. And the idea that I'm going to talk quite a bit about in the second half of the talk, when I talk about my own research, is that the effectiveness of this pump depends on the iron content of the cells. And little, little teaser here, that's what I've spent the last 20 years trying to do, is measure the iron content of cells. Don't leave at the break. <laughs> okay, so this idea that you can add iron and increase carbon uptake by the ocean got lots of attention, not only by the scientific community, but by the general public. And in fact, here's a patent application from 1995, so right after, really right around the time of Iron X2, when a patent was submitted for a method for improving the production of seafood. And this was by, by fertilizing the ocean with iron. And I went and I, could, I thought, well, that's not a very good copy. These people are going to demand a better slide than that. So I Googled it again recently. Got it, and turns out that this has actually been updated fairly recently. This idea and these patents are still being submitted. Again, a process and method of sustainable improvement in seafood production in ocean waters through the addition of iron to HNLC regions. So it's an idea that has gotten a lot of attention in the general public. And there's been an idea on one hand that you could add iron to stimulate carbon uptake and you could sell carbon credits potentially. And then there's another idea that you could actually stimulate productivity and make the oceans more productive, for example, for seafood. And one of the first groups to propose this, or companies, actually, was a company called Planktos. Here's the ship they bought. This actually used to be, this is the RV Weatherbird 2. Debbie may have spent some time on it. it. Sadly, yes. I've heard it was not a great ship. But it was the research vessel based in Bermuda that we used to sample the um, Sargasso Sea for many years. It's been replaced now by, by a nicer All right, on we go. So, part two. How am I, what am I doing? Okay, so I've spent a while talking about things that I don't do, um, but how am I contributing? And so I have sort of in the second part want to talk a little bit about the research that I've been doing. Um, and one of the things I've been doing is I've been getting to, to travel to cool places and kind of an iceberg, beautiful, huge, tabular iceberg off of the Wood in the Weddell Sea off of uh, the Antarctic Peninsula. Okay, graph. Aren't too, I promise there are not many of these, but this is one of them. So, Thinking about carbon and iron, we've been talking about carbon and iron in this first part, and there's a question that we've been getting at, actually, the, the question asked before, what, addressed this, which is what is the efficiency with which you can draw down carbon by adding iron? How much carbon is removed from the ocean by adding a certain amount of iron? And this is a really critical question if you want to sort of predict whether that iron hypothesis of iron controlling climate over these long time fails is reasonable or not. You need to know, well, how strong is this connection? And so on the left, I'm just telling you, these are a bunch of initial estimates. So these are initial estimates, and these are estimates of how much carbon can be drawn down for iron added, okay? And this is on a log scale. This is three orders of magnitude. And so some of these initial numbers suggested that there was a lot of carbon that would be drawn down for a little bit of iron added. In fact, maybe something like 500,000 atoms of carbon would be drawn down for every atom of iron added. And this is exactly the calculation that supported John Martin's comment that give me a tank of a, you know, half a tanker of iron and I'll give you the next ice age because he was thinking, gosh, it's going to be really efficient. However, when we actually went out and did these experiments, and this is why you actually go and do science, these are what we actually measured on this side. This is, these are the efficiencies that were measured in red here. And it turns out that the amount of carbon that was actually drawn down in these uh, iron fertilization experiments was you know, two or th about two or three, or one or two orders of magnitude lower, so a hundredfold less than what was predicted. And so this raises a very sort of important fundamental question of why. Why was the ocean, has the ocean not behaved why we expected it? Why has the carbon sequestration been much less efficient? And that's a question that I've been trying to address through my re research, because one of the reasons that you might guess that this could, excuse me, happen is because the phytoplankton have been greedy. So I worked on this analogy yesterday to see if it works. So if you are planning a birthday party, and you are trying to figure out how much cake to make, and I can say this because my sister's birthday was yesterday. And you might say, well, everybody at the party is going to eat one piece, and so I need to have, you know, a cake with 12 pieces. But if someone comes, your friend comes who loves cake, and they eat three pieces of cake, then you don't have enough cake for everybody else, right? And so the, the greedy person takes up more than they expect. And it turns out that phytoplankton can be greedy too. And when you add iron, those phytoplankton take up more iron than they might otherwise need. And we call that luxury uptake in, in uh, oceanography. And so one of the reasons why 
we might get less efficient drawdown is because those phytoplankton have a lot more iron than John Martin assumed that they did. And so this is an idea that we wanted to test, and we're trying to figure out a way to test that. So here's the question. How, well, how much iron do phytoplankton need? And so we, one of the things oceanographers do is we go into our labs and we grow them. And we grow them under controlled conditions. And this is what Bigelow is excellent at. This is why we have the nation's culture collection. And so these are seven different types of phytoplankton that we've grown, or I didn't do this work, but other people have grown. And this is their iron content. Iron normalized to carbon. Doesn't really matter the units. This is how much iron they have. And you can see that these species take a diff very different amounts of iron. There are some species that, for example, grow in the middle of the ocean that only require very low amounts of iron. And there are some that require much higher amounts of iron. So you can't, not all phytoplankton are the same. And maybe that's not surprising because we probably don't, all humans don't eat the same amount of birthday cake. But uh, so this is sort of lesson number one. We thought, okay, well, we know that all phytoplankton don't need the same amount of, of iron. But how much iron do phytoplankton have? Because that's a little bit of a different question. So in the ocean, how much are they actually getting? It might be different from what they need. And so this is the question that was really coming to the fore as I was, as I was in my graduate work. So here again, I'm, I'm showing the amount of iron in, um, in biology. And here's how much was estimated would be required for a low iron, an iron-depleted culture. So cells that are living in a flask, which we haven't given much iron to, and they're sort of growing as much as they can, but they're really struggling, and they can live with this amount. It's about two micromoles per mole of carbon. Units don't matter. But when, we go out, when people went out into the ocean and actually measured well, we, can't, we couldn't measure a single, a single phytoplankton culture, so what they do is they do what oceanographers do. They'd pass a lot of water through a filter, they'd collect all the particles in the ocean, and they'd measure the amount of iron in that, and they got a much higher number. They got about 50, so about 25 times more. And so there's this question, well, why do this stuff in the ocean have so much iron if they're, you know, if they're living in these low iron places? And this was a really challenging thing to address because on one hand, you're measuring Individual, individual cultures, you know, just your, your, your phytoplankton. And on this side, this is what you're measuring. This is actually what a filter looks like when you pass a bunch of water through it. And if you can see it, it's got a bunch of different stuff on there. There's little specks, and there's big specks, and there's sort of circular specks, and there's lots of different things. There's probably some dust in here. There's probably some dead zooplankton. There's other things. There's not just phytoplankton. So it's almost impossible to make this direct connection. And this is something that I've said about trying to change. This was really the question that I tried to address and I've tried to address. And using a very large tool called the Advanced Photon Source. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about x-rays because this is what this is. This is a very bright x-ray source. So this is a synchrotron is a ring and a ring around which you accelerate electrons. So you accelerate your electrons around and around and when you bend the path of an electron you give off x-rays. So this is it's, this is outside of Chicago. It's at Argonne National Laboratory. It's run by the Department of Energy. And it essentially is a very bright x-ray source. And we've taken our samples here to try to take x-rays of our cells to try to figure out how much iron is in them. So I'm gonna give you, I've, I've got a couple slides here to give you a sense of sort of life at the synchrotron, because has anybody been to a synchrotron before? Oh, we've got a synchrotron scientist here, excellent. So, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, this is to give you a sense of what this is. This is another example of the value of basic science. Nobody built a synchrotron to measure metals in cells, but it's improved incredibly valuable to this study. And I'm going to show you another study that is also enabled by the synchrotron. So this is what the inside of it looks like. High, this is a high energy physics kind of world. Everything's in, in vacuum. These are actually the lines that come in with the x-rays, and they go into these boxes that are lead, they're lead-lined rooms. They're actually just made of solid lead because these incredibly bright x-rays. The x-rays that are produced by this instrument are about a billion times brighter than the x-rays in your doctor's office. So that's what we're doing. You're baking really bright x-rays. So you, you put your sample inside this box, and then you sit at a computer. So here's one of my postdocs, Yoka Neuster, who is uh, probably a little, little punchy at 3 a.m., but... Uh, <laughs> having a good time running the synchrotron. Um, this is an, a facility that operates sort of like the ships do in the US fleet in that you, when you apply, you apply for time and you write a competitively evaluated proposal, and if you're given time on the instrument, you basically get it for free. The government 
your tax dollars pay for this, this service. So you use it 24 hours a day. We're going out next week and we're gonna sit at that instrument for nine days straight. It's gonna be awesome. The other thing you get to do when you're not running the instrument is you get to ride tricycles. So this is a kilometer uh, long ring and if you need to get to the other side of it, you get to ride tricycles. So this is my other postdoc, Dan Onimus, not watching where he's going. <laughs> And this is what actually happens. We have our x-rays, they come in, and we focus them through what's called a Fresnel zone plate, a diffractive optic, and you focus your x-rays down into this very little spot. It's, uh, the spot we use is about 100 nanometers in diameter. So it's, again, it's about a thousandth of a human hair. That's how much we focus that incredibly bright x-ray. And we put our sample in front of that x-ray, and we excuse me, in front of that x-ray beam, and it glows. We hit it with so many x-rays that it causes all the elements in the sample to glow, and we measure that, that, glow, that glow, that fluorescence. So how does this work? So you guys have all seen something like this. This is an x-ray of someone who's in pretty bad shape, an arm with a broken, broken bone. And the way this works is that when you put your arm in front of an x-ray at the doctor's office, it shoots the x-rays down, and it, you have film below it, and it's measuring how much x-rays are absorbed by your body. And so your bones are denser than your skin, and so they're absorbing more x-rays, and so it's lighter. The film is less exposed. So this is great, and uh, it's a great way to figure out if you have a broken bone, but it's not very sensitive. And so when we are trying to measure elements in cells, metals in cells, we want to use something that's fluorescent. We're actually causing them to glow. We're hitting it with such a high beam. And this is an example of that. I know it's hard to tell what this is, but this is a phytoplankton cell. So this is, again, about the size of a human hair. There's two cells here that are attached right there. And you can actually see, when you put it in front of a bright x-ray beam, we're actually able to get maps of the elements that it's comprised of. So this is the silicon that is actually made. It has a glass shell. It's made of, of opal. And you can see where the shell overlaps a little bit. There's a little more opal. This is the iron in it, and then we can get zinc. We actually can get many of the elements, most of the elements that are contained within these cells. We can actually get a two-dimensional map, and we can quantitatively measure them with this, with this technique. It's, it's time-consuming, but, but really cool what you can do with it. So because I was worried that you might not immediately think that this was the most exciting thing you could do with a synchrotron, I came, I've got another example here, another example of basic science showing us cool things. This is something else you could do if you had a synchrotron and a Van Gogh painting. So <laughs> this is the painting Patch of Grass by Van Gogh. And uh, the curators of the museum uh, in, I think, the Netherlands, I think this was in Amsterdam where this exists, uh, were interested and were, had the suspicion that Van Gogh had reused many of his canvases. And they wanted to see if they could actually detect other paintings below the canvas because he used paints that have an elemental signal in this case, lead and antimony and mercury. And so they scanned this entire painting. I mean, this is like a couple feet across. And this is the x-ray absorption image for this part of the painting. So this would be like the x-ray you take of your bone. And you actually can see sort of the outline of a face here. And if you then look at the fluorescence that's caused by the paints, you get that image. This is actually the image of a woman painted you know, behind this canvas that Van Gogh used. So, a, it tells you the difference between absorption and fluorescence. Fluorescence is much more sensitive and element-specific, and it might be a little cooler than what I do. But anyway, something else you can do with X-ray imaging with a synchrotron. Okay, but this is what we do. So we go out, we collect our water cleanly. I've told you how important that is. We put the cells right onto these little electron microscopy grids, and we can look at them. So here's the, the grid bar, and here are our cells just sitting there. And we can go to the cells that we are interested in. We can identify them by their shape or by their pigment content. And we can stick them in front of the x-ray beam, and we can get their elemental content. And here's another example of that. This is a, it's called a silica flagellate. It's got a glass shell again. This is from the Southern Ocean, this iron limited area. You can't really see, but there's chloroplasts in the middle here. And it has a silicon shell. It has sulfur. It has iron. You can see, actually, if you can see those red glowing balls that are the chloroplasts, you can see the iron is in the same place. So iron is really important for, chlor for, for chlorophyll, as I told you earlier. Thousands and thousands of cells now. And um, here's another example we can do. You can say, here's my grid. There's all these particles on it, all these cells. I'm going to pick just this one right here, and there's a bunch of cells here, and I'm going to pick just that one, and that's what we're going to analyze. And so in this way, we're essentially trying to answer this question of how the ocean behaves one cell at a time. And 
An example of the first time we did this when I was a graduate student was this Southern Ocean Iron experiment. And we measured the iron content of the cells. And this was the iron content before we added the iron. And then after the first time we dragged the garden hose around, it went up about 50%. And we dragged the garden hose around, and it went up another, another five-fold. So this is an example of the greedy phytoplankton in the ocean. They, don't, they, don't have, they didn't sequester this much iron, uh, uh, carbon. They sequestered five times less because they took up a lot more iron. And this is the kind of data we've been now um, acquiring around the globe. So in the last 15 or 20 years or so, I've now, and my group has spent quite a bit of time going to the corners of the Earth to collect this kind of data. And these are symbols showing the places we've now collected this data. They go down from the Southern Ocean up to the North Pole and the Arctic, to the North Atlantic where there's quite a bit of iron, into the Pacific where there's much less iron. And this is really now allowing us to give a whole new view of how the ocean, how iron behaves with the biology of the ocean. So I've got some pictures here. I was told that you guys did not want to see all of my data slides that show all of the places we have the, the iron in the cell. So I thought I'd show a couple pictures, and then I'll just hit you with one or two data slides. So one of the places we've, we've gotten to see lots of icebergs uh, in this research, and that is because, again, the southern ocean, the waters around Antarctica are very low in iron, but also because we think that these icebergs, when they break off from Antarctica, tend to fertilize the, the ocean with iron. So icebergs are just chunks of ice that are dragging along the, the ground, and they're covered on the bottom with dirt and with dust. And when they fall off into the ocean and float around, they're basically continuously releasing iron into the ocean. And so we've done projects where we've followed icebergs around and looked at how much iron has, has been added. This was a project more recently at the, up in, in the Arctic, up to the North Pole, where we're sampling algae that are growing on the bottom of ice. And what I love about this picture is that you can't see the, the beautiful icebreaker in the background, but you know, we've put these people onto an ice flow with this lift, super like so many resources that are going into it, and then they're using this ACE hardware bucket, which is like <laughs> just classic oceanography, you know? It's <laughs> and I tell you, I'm sure it was acid washed many times. It's probably the cleanest ACE hardware bucket in the world. So here's a, to show that we don't always go to cold places, this is a cruise I did to the equatorial Pacific, and we were on our way to Tahiti. I'm sure that all of the work had been accomplished at this point, and there I am just, just taking a, a little bit of a break uh, on the deck. Uh, so there's, we're happy that there are warm iron-limited waters as well. I talked a little bit about sinking particles, and one thing we've gotten interested in more recently is not just how much iron do the cells and the phytoplankton in the surface of the ocean have, but how much do they retain that iron as they sink? And does that iron, do they lose that iron at the same rate they lose the nitrogen or the carbon, for example? Because the rate, the various rates will affect where in the ocean those, those nutrients go. And so this is an example of a sediment trap. Um, these tubes are filled with very salty brine water that's very dense. And you open them up and you put it down several hundred feet in the water, and you actually collect particles that, that fall into there. And so we've been analyzing the cells, not just that are living in the ocean, at the surface, but now that are sinking and looking at their metal content and how it changes with depth. And this is off of Bermuda, another, another nice place to work. This is uh, pictures from the Indian Ocean. Uh, again, nice warm place. This is showing, this is Sarah Rauschenberg, who's worked for me for my entire time at Bigelow. I would be totally lost without her. And this is that Kevlar line that goes down to the bottle. And this is how we'd still do it, nice and simple. That is a Teflon messenger, we call it. And once the bottle's at the right depth, you put that messenger on the wire, and you just let it fall down, and it closes the bottle when it gets down to it. So it's simple technology, but super clean. And there they are putting a bottle on the, on the wire. Another place that Sarah's gotten to go is the North Pole. I showed this actually two years ago in my Cafe Sci Talk for you repeat listeners, but uh, it's a great picture. This is the first time a U.S. surface ship had made it unaccompanied to the North Pole. This was in 2015. And you know it's the North Pole because there's Santa, and there is the North Pole. So you know it's legit. I showed this to my seven-year-old, and he was blown away. <laughs> and then he was like, why did you not go on that cruise? You know, uh, <coughs> Just another picture. This is us inside. I showed you the picture of Claire Patterson and, and his lab covered in plastic. Well, this is what it looks like when we go to sea. So trace metal people go into the lab. They walk into the ship that's, you know, these beautiful ships, but they're just, by definition, they're made of metal and they tend to rust. And we shake our heads and we cover them in plastic. So we've got plastic. We've made a bubble. 
and we've positively pressured it with, this is probably a 20 by 10 foot bubble, quite large, and you can see us working on these bottles, and uh, you can, if you can see, this is me looking very confused with, with the 25 bottles we're <laughs> trying to do. Uh, but so much of the work occurs in these bubbles, and everything's wrapped in plastic. And finally, just a, a beautiful picture of an iceberg. Again, I talked a bit about icebergs. You can sort of see this, this layer at the bottom, which is a little iron rich. But um, the other thing I love about oceanography is the ability to go to these amazing places and, and really give you an appreciation for this, this beautiful wor world we're in. So now that I've softened you up with those pictures, I got three data slides, and then we're done. So here's a summary of those results. So when we go around the world, when we take two decades of our lives and measure iron in thousands of cells, this is the kind of data we get. So this, the colors in each of these dots show us the amount of iron contained in the cells in the, in the ocean. And this is the color scale. It's in these same units that are in iron normalized to carbon. And what I want you, you probably are having difficulty seeing these colors, and I apologize for that. But what I want to point out is simply that there's quite a bit of variability over the, over the global ocean. They vary by a factor of 100. So the cells that live in the Atlantic Ocean have 100 times more iron than the cells that live in the Pacific. The cells that live up by the Arctic um, have, a, have actually almost three times, three, a thousand fold more than the cells that live in the Indian Ocean. And so going back to that question of how much iron do the cells in the ocean actually have, we are now finally starting to get an idea of that and understanding how much iron is actually being taken up by this system. And that now allows us to go back and, ask and try to address that question of efficiency. You know, how much iron does the ocean need to live and how much and what will human impacts of iron additions, if we do them, be on the ocean? So you say, well, why do they vary, Ben? Why, do, why does the Atlantic have more iron than the Pacific? And one of the obvious reasons, and this isn't rocket science, so to speak, is that there's more dissolved iron in the ocean. So this is DFE is the dissolved iron concentration. This is over two orders of magnitude, and this is the iron in the cells. And you can basically see, when you have more iron in the ocean, you have more iron in the cells. But it also shows that there are parts that don't fall along this relationship. These yellow circles are from the Indian Ocean. The cells in the Indian Ocean, for an unknown reason still, these are only a couple months old, have a lot less iron than we'd expect. And so is there something genetically about them or ecologically about that system that basically makes them much more efficient at using iron? And that's something we want to try to answer. And the last piece of data is simply that one thing we also see when we look across the entire globe is that there's different amounts of iron in these, in these phytoplankton groups. And three sort of broad groups that we can divide phytoplankton into are diatoms, which are these glass-lined um, cells, and these flagellated cells that can swim around and don't have a glass shell, and then the cyanobacteria, which are the teeniest of the small phytoplankton. They're maybe a micron in size, and they grow in these very um, nutrient-depleted parts of the ocean. And this is the amount of iron that they have on average over the globe, maybe 30, 15, and 9. So you get about a threefold difference between these over the entire globe. And what this tells us is that if iron is added to the ocean by humans or by nature, that it's going to affect what grows in response, right? Some of these require more iron than others. So iron is going to impact the communities that live in the ocean, and that's something we really want to understand. And so, oh, I got one more before my conclusion. So, Getting back to this question that I started in the first half, you know, how will iron addition affect marine fisheries in the ocean? You know, I think the important part of this is that there's a real question mark. You know, if we add iron to the ocean, will we get more of sort of this ecosystem that we might like with fish that we like to eat and healthy things that live on the bottom of the ocean, sort of uh, organisms living there in relatively clear waters, or maybe an ecosystem that has more gelatinous zooplankton or more cloudy waters? You know, we don't know what the iron addition will do. And this gets to that, that point that was raised after the discussion break, that one of the biggest uh, sort of concerns with iron experiments that humans would do is that uncertainty. And that's something we're, we're trying to address in our work. So, in conclusion, oh, so, so what? Three things I sort of want you to hopefully take away from this. First, iron controls the growth of phytoplankton in the ocean. And this is the beauty, this is what we call biogeochemistry, the idea that the biology controls these large geochemical cycles. And for those of intrepid supporters of the lab, you might recognize this background image as the image from our impact report, our annual report from the last year. And we tried to sort of juxtapose the globe and this phytoplankton cell, and sort of to highlight the connection between the single cells in the ocean and this huge biome. And that's something that really inspires me and I think that my work is part of. Second, 
these ocean phytoplankton control the global climate through, through some of these controls, and that's sort of highlighted here. And finally, our work here at the lab and, and in my group is helping us to predict the ocean response to climate change, in my case through iron, in Debbie's case through nitrogen. Other people here study other nutrients and other mechanisms, but all of us at Bigelow are trying to study how our world is behaving and changing through the organisms that live in the ocean. And with that, I'll take some more questions. Thank you.